nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So welcome back. So let's dive in to thermoelectric theory by talking about the first transport coefficient, the electrical conductivity. All right, so this is the first of the four electronic components that we will be discussing. I'm going to use as a starting point here a way of treating transport that has proven very effective in the electronic community for the past couple of decades. It's an approach that's called the Landauer approach. We're going to think about a semiconductor device as having two contacts. The device itself has some length L. Each of these contacts is a large region with lots of inelastic scattering in which thermodynamic equilibrium or very close to thermodynamic equilibrium is maintained under all con uh, conditions. Each of these two contacts is characterized by its own temperature and its own Fermi level. Okay, the Fermi level can be changed by applying a voltage. Now the current through this device, the electrical current, can be shown to be given by this expression. I'm not going to derive this expression. It can actually be easily derived from the Boltzmann transport equation. So I view, I view this basically as a convenient way to solve the Boltzmann transport equation. But it is very intuitive. So we integrate over all of the energy channels. If it's an n-type material, those would be the channels in the conduction band. If it's a p-type material, those would be the channels in the valence band. Uh, there are some fundamental constants out front. Q is the charge on an electron, H is Planck's constant, the 2 is for the spin of the electrons. Uh, the quantity T is the transmission. This is just a number, we're talking about semi-classical transport, not quantum transport, so only numbers, no complex numbers. Transmission is a number between 0 and 1 that just represents the fraction of the current injected from contact 1 that transmits across and comes out contact 2. This quantity M of E is the number of channels that are available to, to conduct current at that energy. You know, what is a channel? My colleague Cipriot Dada likes to tell his students to think of it like the lanes on a highway that carry the traffic flow. Mathematically, M, the channels, is proportional to the velocity times the density of states. You have to have a state for the electron to be in, it has to have a velocity if it's moving from the left to the right or from the right to the left. And then the current does not flow unless there is a difference in Fermi levels between the two contacts. If we have the same Fermi level, Fermi function in both of the contacts, we're at thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay, so that's the mathematical starting point uh, for all of what we're going to do in the rest of this um, tutorial. Now I point out, you know, this is really the subject of another talk, but I'll point out that uh, this is a convenient way to think about transport because we can show that if we go to very small devices, very short devices where the transmission is one and we're ballistic, very small devices where we can actually count the number of channels, then we get this expression for quantized conductance. We learned that conductance is quantized into discrete units of 2q squared over h. If we do a larger device, we can uh, express the conductance in this way. Now the transmission is a number between 0 and 1. Uh, M may be a much larger number of channels. We might only uh, count the number per unit per square centimeter because there are so many. This is an expression for the conductance that is equivalent to what you would get from a general solution to the Boltzmann transport equation, just written in a little different way to break things out into transmission and number of channels. Now finally, if I go to a very long device, many mean free paths long, near equilibrium, so small bias applied, we can show that this expression re uh, results in an expression that has been known for many years for large devices. Current is conductivity times gradient of the electrochemical potential, or electrical engineers would say quasi-Fermi level. Okay, the conductivity we frequently write as nq mu. The electron density we can express in terms of an effective density of states and the quasi-Fermi level for electrons. If you put that into the first expression for current, 
then we get a, an equation that is very familiar to electrical engineers, the well-known drift diffusion equation that expresses current as a sum of a drift component in an electric field and a diffusion component down a concentration gradient. Now, traditionally when we teach semiconductor devices, we begin with the drift diffusion equation in most standard treatments, and all of the rest of this is some complicated material that you take advanced courses to, uh, to learn about. Uh, I like starting here with the Landauer expression, because then you can see how everything fits together, and the drift diffusion equation that is so common for electrical engineers is just one special case of a much more general formulation. So we're going to begin with the Landauer approach. We will be using the Landauer approach uh, to evaluate the four electrical uh, transport coefficients, and then ultimately the lattice thermal conductivity as well. We're going to begin in uh, this section by talking about the electrical current due to voltage differences. This will give us the electrical conductivity. And then we'll do the other transport coefficients in subsequent sections. Okay, so we start at the Landauer expression for the current. Everything depends on the difference in Fermi levels. The Fermi functions are different because the Fermi levels in the two contacts are different because we have applied a voltage to one contact with respect to the other. So when I evaluate this difference, I could divide by the difference in Fermi level and then multiply by the difference in Fermi level. There is a difference in Fermi level because I'm applying a voltage. A positive voltage lowers the Fermi level. So there's a minus Q times the voltage difference there. And I can see that what I have here is a finite difference approximation to a derivative. We can approximate F1 minus F2 by a derivative. It's the derivative of the Fermi function with respect to energy times Q times the voltage difference. Okay, that's the approximation that we're going to use when we apply a small voltage difference, and we're only going to be dealing with small voltage differences. If I take this approximation, put it into my Landauer expression, I'm going to find that the current is proportional to voltage. All of the um, parameters are inside the squiggly brackets here, but what you're seeing is I have current proportional to voltage. Everything in the brackets here is the expression for the conductance of this conductor. This is just Ohm's law. Okay, now we're going to specialize this. This applies to short devices that are ballistic, it applies to long devices, it applies in between. We're going to be interested in conventional thermoelectric technology in devices that are many mean free paths long. Okay, now here's a simple expression for the transmission in terms of the mean free path for backscattering lambda. When the device gets very long, the transmission gets very small. When the device gets very short, the transmission approaches one. We're going to be interested in the situation when the device is many mean free paths long. So the transmission is very small. And we're going to take this expression, current is conductance times voltage. Uh, we're going to develop, we're going to divide by the cross-sectional area of the conductor to get a current density. I have to multiply, there's a negative sign here because we had to find the current positive when it was flowing in the device, but now I want to define the current as positive when it flows in the positive x direction. Um, we will also realize that the difference in voltage between the two ends is a difference between Fermi levels between the two ends, and that means throughout the device then there is a gradient in the quasi-Fermi level or electrical, electrochemical potential. Now I put that all together into my expression for conductance, and we can obtain an expression for the current. The electrical current is the conductivity, which we're seeking to understand here, times the gradient of the electrochemical potential in units of electron volts. And we now have a mathematical expression for the electrical conductivity. It depends on things like the mean free path for the electrons, the number of channels that the electrons uh, have, and on this quantity minus df naught de that came in to approximate F1 minus F2. Okay, so what's the physical picture here? 
We have a very long N-type semiconductor sample to be specific. We've applied a small voltage, so we've lowered the energy on the right with respect to the left. Electrons are flowing from the left to the right. Now, kind of, we're, we're always, we're near equilibrium every, everywhere. And what we are doing conceptually is we're taking a region of this bulk semiconductor and we're thinking of two of these regions as contacts. They're in thermodynamic equilibrium, but they have different Fermi levels because there are, there's a gradient in the quasi-Fermi level between these two regions. So this region L then is many mean free paths long. We've just taken a section out of our bulk semiconductor and now we're thinking about this as our Landauer device. That's the conceptual picture that we're using here. Okay, now within this, between these two conceptual contacts, there's only elastic scattering. All of the inelastic scattering that takes place to keep us near equilibrium occurs in these two conceptual contacts. So conceptually, we've separated out the elastic and the inelastic processes. We put all of the inelastic processes in these conceptual contacts. Uh, as long as this is a bulk sample, infinitely long, separating out elastic and inelastic processes like this does not matter and gives us the same answer that we would get if we solved the Boltzmann transport equation. Okay, so if we put this all together, we now have an expression for the electrical conductivity. We simply have to integrate over all of the energy channels and add the contribution to the conductivity from every energy channel. The differential conductivity here involves mean free paths and channels. Uh, we could write it in this way that the thermoelectric people like to write it in terms of this transport distribution. And now we see that we have a simple physical interpretation of this transport distribution. It is simply proportional to the product of the number of channels and the mean free path for backscattering. So now we know how to make sense of it. If I have a 3D semiconductor with parabolic bands, then I can evaluate the number of channels easily. It's just velocity, average velocity in the direction of transport times the three-dimensional density of states. I could describe the mean free path phenomenologically as some energy dependent mean free path depending on the particular scattering mechanism. If I happen to have acoustic deformation potential scattering, which is a common situation in many thermoelectric materials, this characteristic exponent r is simply zero. Okay, so we have a set of mathematical equations that gives us the conductivity. Um, you know, and you might say, okay, but we measured the conductivity, we know what it is. But there is some more insight that this mathematical equation can give us, which is actually going to prove useful to us later. The question I want to ask now is, at what energy does the current flow? It's flowing in the conduction band, but where in the conduction band is it flowing? Well, if we look at our expression for the conductivity, it involves a derivative of the Fermi function. This, where this derivative is non-zero, those are the energies at which the current is flowing. We'll call this the Fermi window. Now you recall that if we plot the Fermi function versus energy, it makes a transition from one to zero at high energies, and it makes that transition about the Fermi energy. At the Fermi energy, the Fermi function is equal to one half. If we differentiate that Fermi function, and then take minus the derivative, we get a little peak right centered around the Fermi level. In fact, the peak is only a few kT wide. The area under this derivative is one. In many cases, we can treat it like a delta function. Now think about the case where we have a non-degenerate semiconductor. That means the Fermi level is way below the bottom of the conduction bend. In that case, only the tail of this Fermi window is going to be responsible for current flow. All of the current flow will happen very close to the bottom of the conduction band. Now think about a different case in which we have the Fermi level way above the bottom of the conduction band. This would be the case for a metal or for a very heavily doped semiconductor. Okay, now there are states right at the Fermi level the energy is going to flow um, 
right where the Fermi, right where the uh, uh, Fermi window is. So the current is going to flow at the Fermi energy. Whereas in the first case, the current flowed at an energy that was near the bottom of the conduction band and which was far above the Fermi energy. Okay. So it's going to be important for us later on when we understand some of the transport coefficients to understand where in energy the current is flowing. Okay, if we were to plot the conductivity versus the location of the Fermi level, by doping the semiconductor, we could change the location of the Fermi level. As we dope it heavier and heavier, we move the Fermi level up near the bottom of the conduction band. Then we start getting significant current flow, or conductivity, and the conductivity simply increases. If we think about this in a Landauer picture, we would say that the conductivity is increasing because we have more and more channels available for, con for current to flow in. Okay, so that's how conductivity uh, depends on Fermi level. Okay, so we are marching through these four electronic transport coefficients. We've done the first of the four, the electrical conductivity. We have developed a mathematical expression. So the conductivity of each energy channel is related to the differential conductivity, sigma prime. It depends on things like the mean free path for scattering and the number of channels that are available, and we sum those up over all of the energies within the Fermi window. Now, the next step is to proceed to the next transport coefficient. We'll be talking about the Seebeck coefficient next.